Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about innovation in medical bionics. I'm actually going to try to talk about the process of innovation and use medical bionics examples to uh, show you the very many opportunities and ways, different ways in which we can innovate in this uh, very exciting field. Uh, before I start, I really want to thank the, uh, the organisers and uh, the Department of Innovation, Industry, Science and Research um, for, for asking me to come here today. Um, we have been working together with DIISR over quite a number of years and uh, the, uh, many of the, uh, the partners that we have listed on this slide are uh, also working together with DIISR. What we're basically trying to do is to create a medical bionics industry. I'm not just talking about one innovation, but a whole series of innovations that are going to lead to economic and health benefits for Australia. The place that I come from, the Bionics Institute, is really an ideal partner for this kind of innovation. And we're always looking for new people to work with us, people who have ideas. Our mission is to develop medical bionics solutions that will improve quality of life for millions of people with chronic conditions that can't be treated in any other way. So that includes totally deaf people, totally blind people, people with diseases that are not treated well with uh, drug treatments and the like. Many of these people can be treated with medical bionics devices. Uh, the Institute has three main research streams, bionic hearing, bionic vision and neurobionics. And I'll tell you a little bit about each of those today. Within the Institute, we have um, some very talented people. If I just talk about the four who are the most experienced, amongst those four people, uh, in, in total, they have uh, been inventors on over 100 patent families and have more than 100 years, man years, of experience in the medical bionics industry. So there is a huge wealth of experience there, and uh, some of it in industry as well as in research. One of the things that we have realised over the years is that to achieve our vision for clinical improvements, we need industry partners. You cannot go straight from research to clinical outcomes without industrial development and innovation. So in part, one of our goals is to, to make the institute a go-between, between, between the, uh, the researchers with the ideas, industry who can develop things, and the clinical partners. Uh, part of what we do is form clinical partnerships. We have about 12 or 15 uh, honorary clinical research fellows who spend time working with us on their research problems in the clinical field. The potential economic impact of medical bionics is very high, as well as the impact on health. Uh, in 2008, we com commissioned a special study by uh, the Allen Consulting Group uh, to work out what the likely impact of investing in medical bionics would be in 2008. Uh, they considered only two devices, the bionic eye and a device for epilepsy that detects and suppresses epileptic seizures. And from those two devices alone, they predicted that by 2028, there could be somewhere between 220 and $440 million increase per annum in gross domestic product an extra 1,400 to 2,800 jobs in Australia. Uh, we're actually on track to meet these targets. So we're in year three here, where we're still spending money rather than making money. But uh, in fact, I think we're a little bit ahead of where we would have been according to their predictions. So now I'm going to talk to you a bit about the examples. I'm going to start with the bionic ear. Uh, the clinical problem that we were trying to solve was how to provide hearing to people who couldn't hear anything at all, totally deaf people. And that research started at the University of Melbourne in the 1970s. And the innovation was to come up with a multi-channel cochlear implant, a device 
that would go inside people's heads and would stimulate residual auditory nerves. Uh, I started working with that team in 1979. The first multi-channel cochlear implant uh, was implanted in Melbourne in 1978 with a prototype device that had been made uh, with the help of the Department of Engineering. Uh, the picture of the person there is the first patient who was implanted. And he used to come into the idea hospital uh, about once or twice a week so that he could talk to his wife. He could only talk to his wife when he was connected to a bank of computers. One of the innovations that was necessary to go forward from there was actually to use technologies that had previously been used in pacemakers uh, by a company called Telectronics. And the entrepreneur involved was a person called Paul Trainer. And the, uh, the federal government gave a public interest grant to uh, Telectronics, or a new company actually called Nucleus, and the university to take technologies from that prototype device and incorporate them in a, uh, a, a real product. And that happened extremely quickly. Uh, within about 18 months of providing the money, we went from that prototype device, the one that you can see there on the left, to something that looked like this. Uh, that was done by a tiger team of just three people, all engineers, David Money, Jim Patrick and Peter Crosby. And it was one of the strengths of Paul Trainer's approach that he could give these three people in whom he had great trust the job of making a device. And they did it very quickly because they had all of the resources that they needed to do it using the, the money that was provided by the federal government. They showed a great deal of foresight in doing this. The device that they produced had 22 electrodes and the cochlear implant of today also has 22 electrodes. The only competition that they had then was a single channel device with one electrode produced by a giant of a company called 3M. Now, the significance of 22 electrodes is very important in the story that comes because that implanted device didn't need to change its capability to support innovation over the next 30 years. So uh, that is one of the most important things about the innovation stories that I'm going to tell you. You need to think ahead and plan the implantable device, which you can't easily change, so that all of the flexibility is on the outside of the device. The electroneural interface is another important part of the cochlear implant. This is the spiral that goes into the inner ear spiral, and each electrode stimulates a different group of nerves and produces a different sound. So uh, this particular electrode, the contour electrode, was actually also uh, designed and produced using uh, money from a CRC for cochlear implant and hearing aid innovation. That work took place at the Bionics Institute and the Institute was the administering body for the whole of the CRC for about 15 years. This is just one of the, the major uh, improvements that was made. What this uh, uh, electrode does for us is it puts the electrodes very close to the nerves so that we need to use less power in order to stimulate them and so batteries last a lot longer and it actually enabled us to use a behind the ear sound processor instead of a handbag size uh, box that uh, this, this patient here was using at the beginning. So these days, people use a behind-the-ear processor, which is quite a bit bigger than a hearing aid, but uh, it can also be worn behind the, uh, behind the ear. It contains three fairly large hearing aid batteries because of this power consumption problem that I mentioned before. Behind the scenes and inside that, that processor, there was a lot of innovation going on. One of the things that makes the cochlear implant uh, successful is the algorithm that is used to convert from sound to electrical pulse patterns. And this slide here shows, would you like me to stop or keep going? Keep going? Okay. So the, um, th this graph shows improvements in speech perception. The, the, oh, here we are. No, I'm here. 
okay. So the, uh, uh, the, the black bars show improvements in sentence perception with this device. Now you'll notice that back in 1978, when that first patient was implanted, results were not all that impression, not all that impressive. But that was enough, that level of performance was enough to attract the, uh, the funding from the federal government. And very quickly after that, results improved because of changes to the algorithm that was implemented in this behind the ear sound processor. And um, that is what actually accounts for the success of the cochlear implant today. 80% uh, score on this sentence test is enough to hold a normal conversation on the telephone. So people who were previously completely deaf and couldn't use a telephone at all now have the opportunity to interact via the telephone in a very normal way. This video shows children who are having their processor turned on. Now that is a really important story to get across to the market for these devices that children like to hear. They, uh, they don't like being totally deaf. And one of the big uh, uh, problems with cochlear implants in the early days was that people whose children had been born deaf uh, quite often preferred them to join the signing deaf community. Uh, but the fact that those children can now go to a normal school, can use the telephone and have vastly improved quality of life and are happy about it is one of the, the big uh, factors that accounts for cochlear success. These are results from some of the, uh, the children that I have worked with over the years. Uh, each dot represents a different child. These days, children are implanted with cochlear implants very early, uh, quite often around about the six months of age uh, level. And what happens is that they learn to talk, they learn to listen, they learn to understand speech. And the pace of that can be different for different children. But once they reach an equivalent language age of about six years, which means that they can do the same things with language that a normally hearing six-year-old can do, then they are also performing above this 80% level on a sentence test, the same as the, the adults who had been born with normal hearing. So research and innovation are going on continuously with cochlear implants. The problems that we are addressing these days are understanding speech and noise, perceiving tones in, la in certain languages like Mandarin, uh, trying to improve the, the sound quality of music and protecting auditory nerves using nanotechnology. There is a wide open field for further innovation with cochlear implants. Now, back in the 1990s, something different was also happening, that people with some residual hearing were actually performing worse with, uh, with hearing aids than people with cochlear implants. And so, uh, patients with residual hearing started to be implanted and part of my job was to work on what was called the Combionic Aid program to develop sound processing for people who used a cochlear implant and a hearing aid together. And uh, at the same time, during the hearing aid, in the hearing aid industry, things were going from analogue hearing aids to digital signal processing in hearing aids. So this was a very important enabling technology that, uh, that was happening in parallel with the innovation in the cochlear implant area. One of the uh, innovations was a sound processing scheme called ADRO, Adaptive Dynamic Range Optimization. And this was the first sound processing scheme that was available for people with hearing aids in one ear and a cochlear implant in the other. What ADRO does is it breaks up sound into 64 independent channels and adjusts the intensity of each of those to make sure that it's always within a comfortable and an audible level for all of the, each, each band separately. And this applies whether or not the output is going to a cochlear implant or to a hearing aid. By contrast, in the hearing aid industry, most hearing aids had at most four or five channels. So we had gone from four or five to 64 because uh, we felt that that was going to give us a substantial advantage. 
we did a clinical trial with cochlear, with, with cochlear implants and showed that it worked very well. We did a separate one with hearing aids and that hearing aid outperformed the best hearing aids that were on the market at the time. So we decided to, oops, sorry. So we decided that we would uh, start a hearing aid company or a hearing aid technology company in Australia and that was called Dynamic Hearing. Uh, so we took the ADRO technology and we uh, quickly found that when you're licensing technology it's not enough just to have one part of the solution. You really need a complete solution. So using uh, money from Oz Industry with a, uh, a start grant, a BIF grant and a commercial ready grant, uh, we spent a further two and a half million dollars developing uh, three other new technologies. One of them was a directional microphone which improves speech, uh, speech perception in noise. Uh, the second one was very low delay sound processing. Digital signal processing takes time, so uh, in between a sound coming into the microphone and the amplified sound coming out of the hearing aid, in conventional hearing aids, there's usually about eight to 10 milliseconds of delay. Well, we, we reduced that down to one and a half, which means that our uh, sound processing hearing aid has the best sound quality of any of the, the hearing aids that is available today. The third technology was feedback cancellation. Feedback cancellation became very important in these hearing aids because another thing that happened in the, uh, the hearing aid industry was that people introduced open ear devices. That means instead of having a, an ear mould that blocks up the ear, you could just put the output of the hearing aid, the, the, the small transducer, uh, which is the blue bit that you can see in the left hand hearing aid in this diagram here, into the ear canal without blocking it up. And that makes the hearing aid much more comfortable to wear and the sound quality much more natural, particularly for your own voice. But it does introduce the possibility of feedback of the acoustic signal from the ear canal back into the microphone to produce a whistling sound. So we spent a fair bit of time and money on developing a new feedback cancellor that would prevent that whistling from happening. So uh, at this stage, we had a company, Dynamic Hearing, with some fantastic technology. Uh, it went on to be used for people with normal hearing in Bluetooth headsets. The sound quality was, uh, was perfect for that kind of application. And it's also been used in lots of hearing aids and is now being used in mobile phones to improve the signal quality for listeners and to improve the microphone technology for the signal that's picked up. So Dynamic Hearing is a reasonably successful company, but from the Institute's point of view, we haven't really achieved those clinical outcomes that we set out to do. And the reason that we hadn't was that we didn't have a hearing aid to do it. Um, part of what we learned was that you need this complete solution, but you also need a product to sell. It's not enough to be licensing technologies to other people. So what we did was develop a another company, this company called Blamey & Saunders, of which I'm a co-owner, actually delivers e-health benefits, including self-fitted hearing aids using the national broadband network and uh, online sales. Now, this is another sort of innovation. It is a very innovative um, business model. And the reason that we need that innovative business model is that uh, in Australia, there are about three, th three and a half million people who could benefit from using a hearing aid. But only 20% of them use a hearing aid. Uh, in 2006, Access Australia costed the burden of hearing loss in Australia at $12 billion per year. And that's made up of people not hearing things properly, uh, sometimes retiring from work early, uh, as well as the direct uh, loss of quality of life through hearing loss. So this is a very important problem for Australia to solve, particularly as our population are ageing. Between the ages of 60 and 70, you can expect 50% of people to have a significant hearing loss. And only 20% of those people, that is 10% of the people between uh, 
between the ages of 60 and 70 are actually using hearing aids. So the other 40% who have a significant hearing loss but are doing nothing about it need to be reached. Now, why don't they wear hearing aids? There are lots of different reasons. The first one is the cost of the hearing aids. To buy a, a very high quality set of hearing aids, a pair of hearing aids through normal audiological channels can cost you somewhere between five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to twelve thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Uh, the second reason is that there's a stigma associated with, with hearing loss and with wearing hearing aids. So cosmetics are also important. You don't want people to notice that you're wearing a big chunky hearing aid behind your ear. Uh, and the, uh, the other reason is that there's a perception amongst people that hearing aids don't really work and that you're going to walk around with this whistling device in your ear. So if you think about those problems, what I've just told you about the technology development indicates that we've actually solved all of those problems except for the cost factor. And that's where Blamey and Saunders and our innovative business model comes in. So what we have done is to develop a method so that people can fit the hearing aid themselves. Uh, the, uh, the, we call this the, high, the I Hear You system. And you buy the hearing aids and the fitting system and you fit it yourself. Now that saves you a lot of money. First of all, because these very expensive hearing aid prices that I was talking about before are made up of about one third being the wholesale cost of the hearing aid and the other two thirds being the markup of the retail sales channels and the cost of fitting the hearing aids through uh, the, the conventional methods. So if you buy direct from the manufacturer, you pay the one third cost and you don't need to pay for anything else because you do the fitting yourself. So there's no, no retail markup and there's no fitting cost involved. So we have reduced the cost of hearing aids down to about a third of what it would be. We've also solved all of the other technology problems and uh, I think that the, the economic and health benefits to Australia could be huge. So how our service works for the online customer is that they, they order the hearing aids online or by phone. Um, they're actually more engaged in the process. Uh, if they don't like the hearing aids, they can send them back within 14 days for a full refund. So it's uh, a no-risk model for the customer. Um, we provide phone and internet support if they need it, but very few people need it. The next step, of course, is to roll this out also to other countries and to remote regions where audiological services aren't available anyway. So the Bionics Institute is actually quite proud of the, uh, the fact that its translational research is already delivering health and economic benefits to Australia. There's a third company that I haven't mentioned yet called Polyactiva, and uh, this company has a drug polymer technology which is currently under development for two products in the ophthalmic area. Um, in total, these three spin-offs, Dynamic Hearing, Polyactiva and Blamey and Saunders, are uh, already employing about 40 plus people and have a total turnover of about $8 million per annum. So I'm now going to return to medical bionics proper and talk about a different form of innovation. This is the innovation that's going to take us from bionic ears to bionic eyes and to other devices. The same sorts of technologies that are inside that hermetically sealed box that goes behind the ear in a cochlear implant are what we call the medical bionics platform. And by changing the electrodes and the position of those electrodes, we can actually produce multiple devices at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the effort in a fraction of the time. So that is the innovative path that the Institute is on at the moment. One of those devices, of course, is the bionic eye. And you've probably heard quite a lot about the bionic eye because the federal government have provided $50 million through the ARC for the development of new bionic eyes in Australia. The Institute is part of 
Bionic Vision Australia, which is a consortium of five uh, different organisations. And our role is to do the preclinical studies, demonstrating the safety and efficacy in these preclinical studies of the device before it goes into humans. And uh, after that, we will also use our, our psychophysics expertise. In the early days, we needed to understand what sort of sounds were perceived by people when you electrically stimulated uh, nerves in the ear. Part of what we'll be doing in the, in the years to come is to find out what sort of visual percepts people perceive when you stimulate the nerves in the eye. The patients that we'll be working with to begin with are people with retinitis pigmentosa. As it progresses, retinitis pigmentosa turns into tunnel vision so that a very small part of the, in, in the centre of the visual field is all that they can see. But once it progresses to total blindness, they don't even get that. The second group that we will work with are people with age-related macular degeneration. And these people have the opposite sort of problem. Their, their vision starts degrading in the centre and works out. So they have uh, residual peripheral vision, but eventually that can disappear altogether as well. So people who have no, uh, no vision at all are going to be the people who get the first bionic eyes. The way it will work is fairly straightforward, and as you might imagine, there'll be a camera that picks up a picture. Uh, we translate that into electrical pulses that go to electrodes that are inside the eye, and those signals are sent from the outside to the device which is inside. So this idea of having an implant inside that does something fairly simple, i.e. picking up a signal and stimulating the electrodes, is the same as what happens with a cochlear implant. And that's one of the reasons why we can use similar technology to do it, but it also future-proofs the device because as new ideas come up about how to do that translation, we don't need to take the device out and put another one in. The first device that we will produce is called a wide-view bionic eye. It has about 98 electrodes, and those electrodes will go into the eye between the white part on the outside of the eye, the sclera, and a structure called the choroid, which carries blood vessels inside the eye. In front of the choroid is the retina, where the nerves are that we want to stimulate. So what we're doing at the moment is working out how to get the electrodes in there, what size and shape they ought to be, um, what effect is that going to have on the eye, and are they going to be effective in stimulating those nerves. And so far, the prognosis is really good. The reason we want to do this, instead of doing what our competitors do, uh, is that the, the, uh, the device which is furthest forward from a commercial point of view is made by an American company called Second Sight. They have an electrode array that looks similar to the one that we will use, but they put it in front of the retina in what's called an epiretinal position. The retina is a sort of soft, gelatinous structure, and it's pretty hard to attach something to the retina. So the second sight device has uh, fairly um, variable results in terms of not every electrode can stimulate nerves, and not every patient sees the same as every other patient. One of the advantages of this suprachoroidal position that we're going to use is that it gives very um, reliable placement of the electrodes and they don't move around inside the eye because they're sandwiched between the sclera and the choroid. So what we're hoping for is much less variability, much greater reliability in terms of stimulating electrodes and patients. So this innovation of putting the electrodes in a different place is one of the, the most important things that we are doing in BVA. The second device that we're going to work on is a 1,000 electrode array. The reason why we want to have 1,000 electrodes is that we think that the more electrodes we have, the greater the visual acuity will be. Uh, there are some issues in putting a 1,000 electrode array into that suprachoroidal space. It's probably going to be too far away from the nerves that we want to stimulate for each of these electrodes to have an independent uh, an independent um, percept in terms of what the patients see. 
So uh, we're going back to the epiretinal position or perhaps a subretinal position and tackling the, uh, the surgical problems to do with how to fix that array in place. From a psychophysics point of view, we expect that each electrode will produce what's called a phosphine, a sort of primitive visual uh, percept, and that each electrode will produce a phosphine in a different spot. So this is what you might see if you've got 16 electrodes and you turn them all on at once. If you've got 64, it might look like this. If you've got 1,000, it might look like that. Now, if you've got a good imagination, you might actually be able to see what that picture is. This is the original image. So you can see that working with a small number of phosphines is a huge challenge in terms of representing useful information. Uh, we think that the 1,000 uh, electronic device might be useful for reading. You probably can't read this. You probably can't read that. But you probably can read this. So we think that with a 1,000 electrodes, if they really do produce a 1,000 phosphines, we may be able to give people who were previously totally blind the ability to read large print. And that will have a huge effect on their quality of life. Not only will these innovative um, uh, approaches to things provide us with new devices, bionic eyes, we're also developing new technologies. Hermetic sealing of the electronics in a thin polycrystalline diamond package is one of the things that we're working on for the 1,000 electrode device. You can't actually use the same technologies that are used in a 22 electrode cochlear implant to produce something with a 1,000 electrodes because there isn't enough room on the package for a 1,000 feed-throughs to go through the wall. Um, we're also looking at very high density electrode grids. The, uh, using the diamond technology to produce the electrode as well means that we can have electrodes that are only microns across instead of uh, fractions of a millimetre. Um, these same electrodes can probably be used in the brain and we're also developing electrically efficient stimulators to try to reduce the power consumption. Stimulating a thousand electrodes takes a lot more power than just 22. So I want to move on to uh, the third area of the Institute's research, which we call neurobionics. Neurobionics is the, uh, the stimulation of nerves in other parts of the body, anywhere except for the ear and the eye. So uh, positions where it may be uh, important to stimulate are the brain or the spinal cord or neurons in other areas. The first device I want to talk about is a device for the detection and suppression of epileptic seizures. The Institute has been working on this since about 2006 in conjunction with St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. And um, what the device is designed to do is to use electrodes on the surface of the brain to record activity in the brain, use that to detect the onset of an epileptic seizure and then electrically stimulate to suppress that seizure. We've had a lot of success with this in an animal model. Uh, on the left, you can see a distribution of seizure durations in an unstimulated animal. About 25% of the seizures end spontaneously within five seconds. There are actually some devices out there being used in humans that, that do this sort of thing, and we replicated the sort of stimulation that they use in the animal model. And that was successful in reducing the duration of seizures a little bit. 35% of them ended within five seconds. But the, uh, the outcome of our research was a novel stimulation method that actually uh, resulted in 90% of seizures ending within five seconds. So by using this innovative technology in devices for humans, we hope to raise the performance of these sorts of epileptic devices to a much higher level. The epilepsy market is huge. Uh, there are about 1% of, 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 of the total world population who suffer from epilepsy. About 70% of those people uh, can be cured or partially cured by 
drugs, but the other 30% do not respond to drugs. Out of those, about 17% can have resective surgery. That means that the neurosurgeon will cut away part of the brain where the focus of the epileptic seizure is. And uh, in some people that can be done without significant impairment to their cognitive faculties. But the rest of the people have no, uh, no treatment at all. So they are our target population for these devices. We've started using these devices for people in hospital who are undergoing resective surgery. So they're in hospital for about a week before the surgeon actually removes part of their brain. And during that time, we can record from their brain and stimulate the brain to try to suppress any seizures that occur. And we're getting some encouraging results. So we're only a few years away from being able to put this into an implantable device that could be used instead of removing part of the brain in these people. Uh, we have also um, realised that a device on its own is not really going to be sufficient. We need to develop the surgical tools, we need to develop the diagnostic tools and the indicators for who are the patients who will benefit from this type of uh, implant device. And we need to really start addressing the clinical teams who are doing this sort of work around the world. They are our market. They're the people we need to impress. So there are a huge number of patients, potential patients, who could benefit from this. But unless we get the, um, uh, uh, the commercial uh, enterprise working and marketing to the, the neurosurgeons that, that make the decisions and then impress the, uh, the governments that are going to save money or spend money on these devices, um, we will we'll probably not achieve the same sort of success that Cochlear has achieved. So all of that is going on in parallel so that we can very quickly harness these innovations and take them to market. Neurobionics also has um, huge potential for addressing other types of uh, conditions. Psychiatric conditions such as obsessive compulsive disorder and movement disorders can be treated by stimulating different parts of the brain. Uh, this is called deep brain stimulation and exactly the same device that is used for the epilepsy can be used for stimulating other parts of the brain with a different electrode. Again, there are devices like this on the market. Medtronic is probably one of the biggest companies that is doing this. Uh, and the, the current market size is about $364 million per year. And that's expected to almost triple within the next four years. Uh, existing brain stimulation devices are pretty primitive. This is an X-ray of a person who has two deep brain stimulation electrodes implanted in the brain. And you can see that there's a mess of wires and those wires go down to a device that's worn at chest level. We could very easily replace that chest level device with a behind the ear uh, implanted device with a rechargeable battery, uh, a behind the ear rechargeable device using wireless technology to recharge the battery, uh, reduce the number of wires, increase the safety of the operation and increase the efficacy of the stimulation by controlling the stimulus using the, the smart technology that's inside our processes. So the world is our oyster at the moment when it comes to, um, to medical bionics innovation and uh, the, the, the production of real devices. Where we sit at the moment is that the Bionics Institute has strong relationships with industry partners. We have innovative technologies coming from research partners and internal to the Institute. We have strong clinical partnerships. What is missing are the companies and the funding to actually produce prototype devices and to take them to market. Our plan is to start with a company called Bionic Enterprises, which exists but is really just a shelf company at the moment. Within the next 12 months, we'll be seeking about 10 to $15 million from investors to go into Bionic Enterprises. Bionic Enterprises will contract out the 
production of prototype devices to companies and to the Bionics Institute. Uh, the Bionics Institute will take these companies through preclinical studies in exactly the same way that we are with the Bionic Eye at the moment for BVA. When we have devices ready for market, which we are ready for, for extended clinical trials, which we expect to be around about three years' time from now, then we will spin off smaller application-specific companies to take each one of these devices to market. So we're spreading the technical risk, we're spreading the overall total investment so that instead of needing to spend uh, $15 million on each device, we can possibly get three, four devices for a single investment of $15 million. Then the, the marketing uh, risk, the, uh, uh, the, the clinical risk, I suppose, will be taken by these individual spin-off companies. By taking this path, the Institute wants to maintain its strong relationships with the, the spin-off companies and with Bionic Enterprises. I hope that the Institute's research funding will be directed by these uh, companies that have strong connections into the marketplace. And about 50% of the Institute's revenues, I hope, will come from these companies in the form of contracts in the future. So once again, this is a business model and a development model that is new to the industry. And innovation in the way in which we implement our ideas, I think, is just as important as the innovation in the ideas themselves. So thank you very much for listening.